Hey, what's going on AP guys? We have chapter 24, Industry Comes of Age, basically the second industrial revolution in America. Lots to cover today. Let's get going. All right, we're going to start off talking about the transcontinental railroads. And this is going to be post-Civil War. One of the first railroad companies that you need to know is the Union Pacific Railroad, and they started building west from Omaha, Nebraska. And they were going to set up shop with another railroad company. For each mile of track that the Union Pacific Railroad laid down, the government would give them 20 square miles of land. So they were huge, huge land grants as well as loans from the government. And the government really encouraged railroad companies to build railroads to facilitate this growth. The Union Pacific often used Irish paddies or Irish immigrants or people of Irish descent to work on construction for this railroad. They were the same groups of people that worked on canals such as the Erie Canal. Now, the Central Pacific Railroad, and notice the word Pacific, this is going to start from California and start going east. And because they are in California, they are going to use predominantly Chinese labor. Asians, when they would come to America, they would come to the West Coast. It is just geographically closer and easier for them to come that way. And the Central Pacific Railroad Company was given the same subsidies as a Union Pacific Railroad Company. Another one that you may need to recognize, but definitely know the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific is the Great Northern. And the key word there is Northern. So this is going to be in the Northern part of the United States and it's going to connect Minnesota to Seattle. Now the blue line here is the Union Pacific Railroad and the red line is the Central. Okay, some improvements go that happen with railroads. We have Cornelius Vanderbilt who made millions and millions of dollars in the railroad industry and he popularized the steel rail and we'll talk more about steel with Car Carnegie or Carnegie in just a little bit. Two improvements in railroads. First and foremost, they were steel rails instead of iron rails. They are safer, stronger, and they last longer. Once the Bessemer process comes along where you can make steel when you can make steel cheaply, it is even more economically feasible. The other one is this idea that every single train, every single track will have a standard gauge of a track. So no matter where you are, you will all use the same gauge and it will be easy to change from railroad to railroad. Think about interchangeable parts here. And this was popularized by a gentleman by the name of, here's a picture of him. Do you remember his name? Eli Whitney. What else did he invent that changed America? The cotton gin. Okay, some other advancements. We have the Westinghouse air brake, which made it easier uh, and safer for trains to slow down. And then we also had Pullman Palace cars, which were very fancy, classy train cars that people would ride on. All right, railroads created an enormous domestic market for American raw materials and manufactured goods. In other words, it allowed people to ship their goods all over the country. This is huge. They are expanding more. You can ship you can ship goods further and faster. Some other impacts is stimulated immigration, especially for building these railroads. Railroad industries loved having immigrants work. They could have them come over here and work for very low wages. The establishment of time zones, if you look here, used to be the whenever the sun was at its highest point. Now noon in Buffalo may be different than noon in Cincinnati, may be different than noon in Pittsburgh. So the, so the idea was that most states would be on the same time zone here. So noon in Buffalo is the same as noon in Pittsburgh is the same as noon in Cincinnati. It cut down on complications and issues that may arise, that may arise from shipping. All right, so railroad companies are gonna get very, very big and strong and powerful and they're gonna start abusing the industry and in particular farmers. So we have a couple of terms you need to know. Stock watering is when railroad stock promoters grossly inflated the value of their stock. Basically they said it was worth a lot more to get people to buy their stock and they could make lots of money. Railroad tycoons became very, very powerful. They had lots of money. They would bribe judges and legislatures. They would employ lobbyists who would lobby on their behalf or go to Congress and, and get laws passed that would be favorable to them. They would form pools, which is basically a monopoly. When you see pools, monopoly, trust, it's all the same idea here, guys. That you're basically just controlling prices and you are hurting the consumers. And if they were shipping from, let's say, Buffalo to Rochester or Buffalo to New York City, uh, they would go over the same track. At Buffalo to Rochester is a lot closer. They would charge more money for short hauls than for long hauls, and this would definitely hurt farmers. So farmers are going to be very upset, and this is, will be a theme of the coming chapters. So should the government intervene and break up these trusts and monopolies? Now this goes against this long-standing belief of laissez-faire philosophy, and think of Grover Cleveland. He was a president that was a laissez-faire advocate. In other words, the government keeps its hands off the economy. It does not intervene. Well, farmers are going to start to organize. 
um, and they want to regulate railroads. So one way they'll do that is they will appeal to their states. This will set the stage for something called the Wabash case, which goes to the Supreme Court. Some states will try to regulate railroads, but because they deal with interstate commerce, it means between states, the Supreme Court is going to say, nope, bad, you can't do that. Remember the first Supreme Court case that said that Congress had control over interstate commerce? Gibbons v. Ogden, 1819. So what is set up is the Interstate Commerce Commission, or the ICC, which is established by the Interstate Commerce Act. And this prohibited rebates and pools. And rebates were basically really cheap, cheap tickets for certain groups of people, including congressmen. This is very important to know. It's the first time ever that there is a large-scale legislation passed by the federal government to regulate corporations in the interest of society. In other words, this is the first time the federal government tries to regulate an industry. It really didn't do much at all, um, but it was a stepping stone in the right direction. And we'll see more and more acts that will be passed that will be stronger. Pens were issued at really high rates, which gave you protection for your invention. And some key inventions, we had the phone by Alexander Bell. This leads to women working the switchboard, so that this will promote a new industry for women to work in. So the electric light, the phonograph, mimeograph, dictaphone, moving pictures, all sorts of new things that people never really imagined before. This slide, you definitely need to know the difference between vertical and horizontal integration, as well as the people associated with each. So Andrew Carnegie, or Carnegie, if you will, he was a steel tycoon, and he worked in Pittsburgh, hence the name of the football team, the Pittsburgh Steelers. He introduced this aspect of vertical integration, and what this means is controlling every aspect of production from beginning to end. So every single thing that his steel company produced was only touched by hands of Andrew Carnegie's workers. So in other words, the, the iron ore that they would start with, those natural resources, then it would go into a factory with the Bessemer process, and they would blast hot air into this iron and then make steel. All of that was owned by Andrew Carnegie. Start to finish, everything is owned by him. This improves the efficiency, supplies are more reliable, but most importantly, it eliminates the middle men's fees. Guys, this is legal. Vertical integration is legal. What is not fine is something called horizontal integration, which Rockefeller with his oil industry uses. And he owns most or all the businesses in an industry. So he would go up to competing oil industry or oil companies and buy them out. So Chances are, if you had to buy oil in the United States at this time, it would be through Rockefeller. That is illegal. Know the difference between those two. If you have any questions, it doesn't make sense, still put them in the comments, and I'll explain them a little more. All right, Andrew Carnegie writes something called the Gospel of Wealth. And he basically, this was a justification for why the rich are rich and why it's okay. He believed the wealthy should be morally responsible. And when they die, they should give away lots of their money. That's why we have Carnegie Hall. There are thousands of libraries set up because of Andrew Carnegie's money. He plays on this idea popularized by Herbert Spencer, taken from Darwin's ideas, called the survival of the fittest. Rockefeller loved this too. Um, it justified him having this big business. Hey, it's the way the world works. If you look at animals, the, only the strong survive. They applied these ideas to businesses and humans. Okay, another thing we have is the Sherman Antitrust Act, and this is going to be stronger than the Interstate Commerce Commission. And this is created in response to public demand for curbing excesses of trust. In other words, thanks Rockefeller, you ruined it for everybody, now we have to start breaking up these monopolies. And this forbade combinations and restraint of trade. This is the purpose of the Sherman Antitrust Act, to break up monopolies and trust. Please know that's the purpose. This is largely ineffective, though, because they had no significant enforcement mechanism. In other words, there wasn't a whole lot that the government could do. However, the purpose of this, again, was to break up monopolies. In actuality, in practice, it was used by corporations to curb labor unions. So this was used against labor unions. You need to know that. The purpose of the Sherman Antitrust Act was to break up monopolies. In actuality, it was used to break up unions. Not what the legislatures had in mind when they passed this. Let's talk about the impact of the Industrial Revolution. We have standard of living rising sharply. Urbanization, the growth of cities developed as a result of factories. People want to be close to where they work. Workplace became regimented, regimented and impersonal. You go there for eight hours a day. You could easily be replaced. The boss didn't really talk to you. 
Women achieve social and economic independence. New careers such as typing, stenography, and switchboard operating again from phones. And because of this, mostly these women were single women, so they did not get married at as young of ages. Marriages were often delayed and families, smaller families, were a result. Okay, we're going to finish up a couple slides talking about unions. Unions are simply a group of workers in the same industry that, that come together. And the reason for unions was because of massive immigration. Immigrants would come here and they would work, would work for cheap wages and unions wanted to try to get the power back on their side. So workers would get together and form a union. Businesses would have several advantages against unions. One, they could import strike breakers or scabs, and oftentimes these scabs were immigrants. The courts could order strikes to end, and an example of the federal government getting involved is President Hayes, who used the military to break up or subdue the strikers. Every time you see a question about a president and strikes, they are going to side with the owners of business, except for Teddy Roosevelt. We also have yellow dog contracts, which basically if you were applying for a job and the company would say to you, okay, sign your name here that you swear you will never join a union, and if you do, we can fire you. That is a yellow dog contract. And also a blacklist. If you're a member of a union, your name will be passed around and no place would hire you. You'll see a blacklist for communists later in the 1900s. Okay, three labor unions you need to know. The first one is the National Labor Union. This was a major boost to the union movement. Eventually, it had as many as 600,000 workers. This was really the first large-scale nationwide union. They excluded Chinese. Again, this idea of immigrants working for cheap wages and taking jobs and being scabs. Doesn't last very long. Then we have the Knights of Labor, with, which is led by Terence Powderly, who may just have the greatest mustache in the history of AP. Much of the leadership and membership was Irish, and one thing that the Knights did that was different than any other labor union, hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, is that they sought to include all workers into one big union, including blacks and women, and it's not up here, but skilled and unskilled workers. They wanted an eight-hour workday, and there's the skilled and unskilled workers. Very important to know they combine both skilled and unskilled workers. It's the only labor union you need to know that does so. There are 1,400 strikes over a period of time and people start to dislike the Knights of Labor because of all these strikes and these disruptions to the economy. The one thing that sets everybody over the edge is the Haymarket Square bombing. And we have this German anarchist or somebody who is against government sitting in the crowd where there's this big giant protest going on. Lots of anarchists are in the crowd. Somebody, nobody really knows who, throws a stick of dynamite, blows up, it kills or injures dozens of people. Here's the Haymarket Square. You can see there's just people everywhere, lots of chaos. Knights were associated with the anarchists. Everybody began to associate the Knights of Labor with the Haymarket Square riot, and they this basically is the end of the Knights of Labor. Now we need a, un, a new union to come along, and this is the American Federation of Labor, led by Samuel Gompers, who looks remarkably similar to Colonel Sanders from KFC. Maybe that's just me, but I think he does. He really focused on just economic issues such as that he called bread and butter issues. Eight hours for work, eight hours for sleep, eight hours for what we choose. That was his slogan for the AFL. And the biggest difference, I see lots of questions, guys, comparing the AFL and the Knights of Labor. What is the difference between them, the two? The AFL consisted of only skilled workers. There were no unskilled workers. That is huge to know. Skilled workers are harder to replace. This consisted of association of self-governing national unions with AFL unifying the overall strategy. In other words, it was just one giant union with lots of little different unions along the way. But please know it consisted of only skilled workers. And the chief weapons were the walkout and boycott. Walkout basically mean a, means a strike. A boycott is refusing to buy goods from a company. And if you have hundreds of thousands of employees that or people in your union that can cause negative effects for the businesses. Okay, that's it for me. Lots of stuff we covered here. Uh, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments or feel free, feel free to email me. If you have not done so already, please subscribe to my channel, guys. If you value these, if you find that these videos are helpful, all I ask is that you please spread the word. Tell somebody, tell people in your class, tell your friends. I really want to reach as many AP people as possible. So if you find value from these videos, please do me a favor and spread the word. Post on Facebook, Twitter, tell people in your class. Whatever you can do to help me, I would greatly appreciate that. If you have any ideas for future videos as well, please let me know.
That's it. Have a good day, guys.